everyone. Welcome back to the Advanced Thyroid Series. I'm your host, Karen Martell, and today we're going to be talking about one of my fave things to talk about, which is food and diet and dieting dogma and what kind of food should you be eating when you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism and just kind of having that right mindset. And with me today is my fellow Canadian podcaster at that, Marnie Wasserman. Marnie, oh, simply said, Marnie Wasserman's life is rooted in healthy eating and healthy living. Not only a nutritionist and chef, but also the host of the Ultimate Health Podcast. She is also the author of Fermenting for Dummies and Plant-Based Diet for Dummies. Marnie uses passion and experience to educate individuals on how to adopt a real food diet and a balanced lifestyle through simple strategies. Marnie loves to spend her time creating new recipes, practicing yin yoga, biking outdoors, or playing with her Australian shepherd, Goji. So welcome, Marnie. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. How does it feel to be the guest on podcast? And you're probably so used to doing the interviewing, aren't you? Yeah, it's fun. It's nice. I know, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it's good to kind of get into my story, my journey, but it's also just fun to see other people interview too. So it's great. I love it. I know, I know. I I love it too. I always get excited because I feel like there's not so much pressure. I can just sit back and do what I do best, which is chat. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And you're over in Toronto, correct? I was in Toronto. That's where I'm from. Oh, okay. But now, which is possibly going to be part of what I share later on, but I made the move to a smaller city in Windsor, Ontario. So it's about four hours west of Toronto. So a little bit more low key, a little bit more conducive to yes. a slower paced lifestyle. Yes. But, uh, yeah. So I'm in Windsor, Ontario, which is right across from Detroit to give fellow Americans. Okay. Contact. Yes, yes. I actually did the same. Away. Like a year ago, I moved to a really, like, it, it's not even a city. It's a very small little village, you would probably call it, but it's a little town, a little lake town outside awesome. the city. Same reasons, just to have that quiet, live in the mountains feel, right? And yeah. yes, we'll be getting into why why you should all be moving away from the city. <laughs> If you have Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, right? So Marnie, I love your story because you came from this like hardcore vegetarian lifestyle. So can you take us back to when that was and kind of what what was going on for you and what, what basically started to happen to your health and what you have to do about it? Yeah. Well, the funny story is I actually had this fascination with vegetarianism as a little girl. There was something about it that just seemed like this is the way to eat. My best friend at the time was vegetarian. Her sister was. I was in grade six. I was so young, but it just seemed so fascinating and so right. I didn't make the switch at that time, but I did test it out in high school for a couple of years. And then my mom weaned me off of that, (laughs) but red, red meat stayed out. Um, but I went back to chicken and fish and then years later, when I started learning about nutrition and health and when I went to holistic nutrition school, the conversation at the time was so deeply rooted in vegetarianism. And this was 10, 12 years ago when it was really big, like the messaging across, well, social media wasn't big then, but the messaging through teaching I found and all the books that were coming out were all around raw, vegan, vegetarian. And I was like, okay, this is my time. I'm going to do it. This feels right. This is the way I want to live my life. This is the way I want to raise my kids. I want to meet a partner who's vegetarian. I was in. So, and that was the same timing right around when I started to create my business. So I had become a nutritionist. I went to culinary school and I decided I want to open up my own cooking school after I was done. And course it had to be vegetarian because I was vegetarian at the time and that's what I want to teach about that's what I want to educate about and it felt right like I felt good on the diet it felt right to teach people about it I was really focused on whole foods healthy foods we weren't just making pasta and pizza in every class we were really learning how to soak and sprout and you know use tons of vegetables and healthy fats and beans and this was great for a good six to seven years is how I ran this business and I started to slowly feel some shifts in my health. It took time for me to kind of put the puzzle pieces together, what was going on. I had no idea in the beginning, and I certainly didn't equate it to my diet because I was the healthiest vegetarian. So it it was really hard to kind of isolate that, but I kept seeing different naturopaths and different health practitioners. Blood work kept coming back, and I had the odd response like, have you ever thought about 
bringing animal foods back into your diet? Have you ever thought eating about a little bit of chicken or fish? I'm like, no, no, no. Like I'm, I'm done. I'm good. Thank you. I, I, I've got this diet thing down. Did you and, see stuff in your blood work? Yeah, it was, it was hard to say what exactly, but I just know through my adrenals, my thyroid, and certainly the shape of my blood cells, because I was getting some live blood cell work too. Mm. Um, I was showing a lot of undigested food in my blood and things like that, that was kind of coming up that was leading my naturopath to believe that we need to shift something through your diet because the supplements I'm giving you is not enough. So yeah, he saw more than I saw. I didn't fully understand the full picture at the time. So it took a good couple of years for me to wrap my head around that. And then through the journey of the Ultimate Health Podcast, my podcast, I've had the opportunity to interview so many different people who had a very similar story. And a common friend of ours, Elle Russ, was on the show, and she was definitely one of those people where it was like the same thing over and over. It was like, Marnie, how many times do you need to hear that you know, maybe your diet is something to look at. Maybe you should explore what else is going on with your health. Cause at the time I knew something was wrong, but I certainly didn't know it was Hashimoto's. So I eventually figured out that I need to go and get better blood work. I was getting good blood work with my naturopath, but I wasn't requesting the right tests with, uh, for my thyroid panel. And when I did that and it came back and it was showing me that You know, I definitely had high antibodies and I was just learning about it at the time. And I was like, I was able to diagnose myself. I'm like, I have Hashimoto's. (laughs) This is all making sense. (laughs) What the heck? (laughs) What the heck? And a year or two, it was probably one to two years before that I actually got that diagnosis that I had already started to bring animal protein back in. So just to backtrack a little bit, I'd already Mm -hmm. started to realize that, you know, I, I can bring bone broth in, a little bit of fish, a little bit of chicken. And so when I found it at Hashimoto's, it was kind of confirmed that what I was doing was the right thing and that being a vegetarian was not <laughs> what I needed to do anymore. So it was an interesting, you know, transition and it took a long time. It was about three years all in or more. I did like eggs, then fish, then chicken, then red meat. And wow. it was over the course of a long period of time. So I, I really tuned into my body and checked in to see how I felt physically, energetically, emotionally. There was a lot of moving parts to this. Yes. Oh my gosh. I bet I did go vegetarian. Yes, I did. I lived in Boulder, Colorado for a couple of years and everybody in Boulder, Colorado is vegetarian. They they were 20 years ago when I was there. And so that was my stint. I think I did about a year of vegetarianism, but I certainly was not doing it like looking back I think all I ate was soy like it was just mm-hmm. tofu this and fake the fake ground beef like oh just looking back I just think oh my god what I must have done to my body back then oh my gosh you know it, it just wasn't healthy at least you it sounds like you were doing it in a good way at least right without not a lot of faux meats in there. Exactly. I, was. <laughs> I was doing it really healthy I was still eating some soy but it was mostly tempeh or organic tofu I was adamant on top quality wow and yeah and all my grains were mostly gluten-free or they were ancient grains like spelt and kamut and oh. fun stuff but because you know what my- I was Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say it was just more than what my body probably could handle at the time, but yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. So, Well, it's interesting. I don't know if you have found this too in your research and talking with other professionals and health experts that I remember researching the heck out of um, raw food diets and vegetarianism, like I would say probably about 15 years ago when I started to run into a lot of my own health problems, I started to think maybe I better go back to being a vegetarian and then yeah it was probably it was after my daughter was born so about 10 years ago I started I remember watching this woman talk about raw food like eating becoming raw Mm -hmm. and I was like gung-ho I'm like oh my gosh this is the answer like I must I have to become raw and it's really funny because I think back now to the woman who taught the course who is extremely overweight Mm. isn't that odd and then as I started researching and thinking this is my next best thing Everything I came across, especially in forums, I'd have to say mostly in forums, it was this running theme that raw and vegetarianism and vegan seem to do really well for a person's body for the first seven years. That's have you pretty much my time? Frame. Yes. When you said six to yeah. seven years, I was yeah. like, I'm not surprised because yeah. I've heard that so many times where it's 
it's done wonders for people's body in the beginning. And I think that that's really just pulling away from a lot of processed foods probably. Exactly. It's people coming off of the sad diet and eating a very unclean diet. And the raw vegan diet is very sexy. Like it really it comes across as you're eating lots of veggies and you're juicing and you're sprouting and you're doing all this stuff. Like it, it sounds good, especially to someone who's a foodie. It sounds really good. Um, so that's probably why you felt pulled in, and especially when they're listing off all the things that it can cure, which yeah. again, someone who is coming off of a sad diet, who has diabetes, who has diabetes or some kind of chronic illness, and they make that shift, they're very likely to feel very good and, and maybe meet those markers and maybe bring, you know, come off of certain medications or lower their insulin or whatever it might be. Yeah. Lose weight. Yeah. 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 That plateau. And then you got to kind of reevaluate. And again, it's not some people, I'm sure there are some people who are thriving on a long-term vegan diet. hundred percent. But I find more people thrive on a long-term vegetarian diet because then they're getting at least a little bit of that animal protein in there. Yeah. Um, but the vegan diet, yeah, it's, it's, it is a hard sell. I don't find very many people anymore who are, who are thriving on it. No, and I always tell my clients and everybody else when I speak on other people's podcasts, I always make sure I say to them, every diet has been proven to work. Mm-hmm. Like people get so focused and so tunnel vision on their perfect diet. And this is what is great for everybody in the whole world. And it's just not true. Like you can find science, you know, the perfect health diet. We got all these other, um, you know, the one that was that the perfect health diet, the one where she just bashed, um, eating meat or was that, or was that the, I can't think. Uh, Four Corver Knives. Oh, that, was the docu- knives. that was the yeah. documentary. Yes, and then there was a book that was written about, anyways, that, you know, you can't eat me. And there's all, oh, she put all this science to back it. And I'm like, there's science to back everything. 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 I read a book on it, as you said in my Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Plant based diet for dummies. And that was right in the heart. That was probably four or five years into it. I was like gung ho. And this was the message I wanted to spread to the world. So it's on paper, it's documented. I have studies at the back. <laughs> proving that yes. this is the right diet. So it's interesting. And it goes to show that things can change. Yes. So that that's out there. And that's my legacy to some people. I still get people emailing me saying, Oh, I just got your book and I just became plant-based. Thank you so much. I'm You're like, going, Oh no. Um, <laughs> Great. Thanks for the sale. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got something else to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So looking back, do you feel that there was something that you were eating in that diet that triggered your Hashimoto's because we know that we can have the genes, but whether or not we express those genes, right. And you were doing okay prior. So do you like looking back, was there, you know, either stressful moments, you know, where you went through a stressful period of time or would would you say it was the diet? Is there anything that you can kind of correlate now with it? There is quite a few things. So I think the diet in that piece from some of the stuff that I've been learning, I can't say it was one particular food, but I think the accumulation of grains, of beans, even of that moderate amount of soy that I was eating, I think that probably played a toll on my gut health and really affected it. Because from what I'm learning, when it, you know, it accumulates and your body can't process it and digest some of those fibers and the lectins, it can really cause the leaky gut term that we all (laughs) throw around all the time. So, and I think I found that because my digestion was feeling great for a certain amount of time. And then all of a sudden things weren't working as well. So something had to have happened down there. So there was that piece of the puzzle, but again, we know stress plays a role in that too. And at the same time, so what I didn't complete with my story is, so I started teaching cooking classes. I'll kind of go back Mm -hmm. for six years in my parents' home. And then I opened up my own food studio. So I stepped out and opened up my own brick and mortar space. And this was at the same time I was going through a divorce. I was, you know, transitioning so many other things in my life. And I had just met Jesse shortly after that. There was a lot of change, a lot of stress and a lot of moving parts. So if I were to go on a timeline, you know, between the divorce, changing my diet, you know, opening up a business, that's a lot of things at once. And it's even though a lot. I, I felt like I had it under control, those little moments where you feel like, you know, your stomach's caving in and you can't swallow and those nights where you're crying, that's playing a toll on your body and in yeah. ways that we can't ever describe or ever figure out. And so I, I think that was definitely part of it. Um, then there's me traveling to different places over the last number of years where I may have picked up certain bugs here and there. I know I went to Costa Rica and came home with 
crazy diarrhea. So something was there too. Oh and yeah. Definitely a relation to stealth infections. So I think there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle and yeah. And I think just the stress of running a business. So I went from my parents' home, which was cushy, overhead was covered. It was a little bit easier. I wasn't having as many cooking classes to now this full-time business. I had to pay rent. I had to pay staff. I had to pay utilities. So just so many things that that pushed me over the edge. Absolutely. And, and saying that you went to Costa Rica and you came back with, you know, you had the infection when you were down there. Um, I've done a ton of world travel myself and I've had the, all those fun infections that you get, all the parasites. Um, but in my research that I've been doing the last few years, there is this strong correlation between blastocystis hominis and Hashimoto's. So you you know this. She's, I know she's this. nodding yes. <laughs> I, did, I did my G, GI map test. Okay. That came up, H. pylori. And then there's another funny little guy, another funny little parasite that was in there too. That's very- Defragilis? Maybe. I Defragilis know. goes head in hand with Blasto. Okay. C. diff. There's a couple. Yeah. yeah. Like that. So yeah, ones. those were all there. And then- Interesting medicine team was like, okay, these are correlated with Hashimoto's. How yes. and why? I don't know. So I don't again, understand it either. Yeah, I, no, it's so, that is so, I mean, talk about, we're talking an advanced thyroid series. So yes, yes it, th this is advanced, but blastocystis hominis is one of these really weird parasites that some people have horrific symptoms from, and then other people have nothing from it. So I thought when I was like, okay, I've got blastocystis, like I'm going to go, you know, take all these herbals and get rid of it and antibiotics. And I felt no different after. And I was like, I don't think that was a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did I just do to my gut? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And even with H. pylori, some people have yeah. effects of that heartburn and stomach discomfort. And I haven't had any particular symptoms. So what mm. I encourage people is if they do and can work with a team, a functional medicine team to get these tests done, and especially a GI map, that's the test you would want to yeah. look for. And you find out, you know, your panel and which friends and bacteria and fun friends you have. have. Yeah. Then what that team will hopefully do because they'll be able to guide you is get you onto a protocol where they tackle one thing at a time. Because I think that was key for helping me to heal too, was uh, starting with certain things in the gut, not everything, because you had to kill certain things off in order for my body to absorb the next layer of nutrients. So, you know, there's, there's so much information there, but it's really important to work with a well-rounded team who can look at these blood test results more thoroughly. So and so can you tell us a little bit, actually, and break that down for us about kind of your your journey through it and kind of what you started to knock off first? Because I, I interviewed Dr. Gary Forsman yesterday, which is, he's a fantastic functional medicine practitioner. And he was like, you should test for this, 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 this. And I'm like, you know, people that are listening to this often can't go out and pay $5,000 for all of these tests that you're talking about. And it's kind of about figuring out what it is that you need to do. And we're going to talk about diet about this as well. But just as far as testing goes, it's really good to kind of go, okay, what are some main things here that are going on and kind of start knocking them off? So what was yours that you kind of, what order did you go through? First okay. changed your diet? Um, yes. So the diet changed first. So slowly over time, I took out the grains, I took out the beans, and I started to bring eggs and bone broth in. So that was phase one. Phase two was bringing in some fish and that was like four months later and then chicken and started to really reassess how I was feeling. I wasn't eating a lot of sugar, but I lowered my sugars even more. So that was about a year intensive of, of changing my diet. In that year, I also made the decision to leave my food studio and to close up that business. So Jesse and I had started the podcast at this time. And we saw the potential for having this virtual business and moving anywhere and working online and the stress that that could take off and the financial potential. So that decision, which was stressful, of course, and mm -hmm. tying up all those loose ends and closing down a physical business, not easy, but for the better. Yep. Um, so that was kind of phase two is making that decision and us moving to Windsor, which is a smaller city. So where I was living in Toronto, I was living across from my food studio, which was a downtown core of the city, lots of pollution, lots of buses, lots of noise, lots of people, just so much going on. And even though it's a city I grew up in, 
it's so interesting when you start to become sensitive to all of this oh, yeah. and in tune and also having had dated Jesse who came from a smaller town and over the last four years I got to see okay, this is what easier small town people are like. And this is what, <laughs> you know, simple living is like. Yeah. So it, it took a while to accept that I would move outside of my hometown in a busy city, but I knew that this is what my body and my health needed. So that was another step to the process. So when we moved out here and we moved into a home at, from an apartment. So we have a home with a basement, which we can escape to. We have a backyard where a dog can run, like just space and freedom and time to, you know, me to create a morning routine in the morning. So as soon as we moved, I was able to put all these practices into place. I didn't have a business to show up to every day the same way that I did before. Of course, with the podcast, it's a full on business, but I didn't have to go into a food studio and, you know, and run that. So it was a lot nicer for me to, or a lot easier, shall I say, for me to create some self-care routines and put them into practice. And, and then I can also focus on my nutrition and this new way of eating that I was starting to focus on. It was a whole new learning. Like Mm -hmm. I remember getting one of my first cookbooks. Um, so I, hold on. I, then I had heard about AIP. So I'd already made switches, found out about AIP and then was gung ho. I'm like, okay, this is what I need to do. If I have Hashimoto's, I need to really take things up a notch. So I was eating gluten-free. I don't think I was eating grain-free at the time. So I, I made all of those switches. And then I got my hands on the Healing Kitchen cookbook from Sarah Ballantine and Elena yeah. Hager. And I just soaked it up. And I have never been one for a lot of cookbooks, even though I accumulate them and I've written some. You know, I collect them, but I don't Same. follow them. Same. <laughs> so I'm looking over at them right now. That's why I'm looking to the side. So... But this one, I have a thousand tabs on. I, you know, have dug right in because it was taking all of these foods that were now okay for me to eat and I could innovate and have so much fun with new recipes. And I didn't even miss the grains. I didn't miss anything that I was eating. And I was just so focused on nutrient dense foods. So it was a whole new learning, which I was excited about because I love to cook and I love to eat. So that was super fun for me. Yeah, no kidding. And so, and then at what point did you say, okay, I'm going to start getting rid of the gut infections? And is that, did that come out next? That came next. So after we moved here and then I'm just trying to think of the timeline. Yeah, I was diagnosed. And then I think the following fall is when we started to work with a functional medicine team and figured, okay, yeah, the diet's down, the lifestyle's down. Let's tackle the next layer. So, hmm. and that journey, it's, it's a long one, especially if you're it working is. with a really comprehensive team who can look at things thoroughly. Fortunately, they're thorough. Unfortunately, it's it's a lot of work. It can be a lot of money to you know spend on these tests and to get all these supplements. Um, but again, it's it's part of the it's healing process. It. Yeah. It's worth it. It's worth it. And you know, you can take on certain things that feel right and maybe scale back on others. But at the same time, if you follow the protocol well, you should start to piece together different layers of your health at a time. So I've been on that. I've been feeling a lot better. I've noticed a big difference in my antibody levels. I've been feeling a lot better overall, especially with a lot of the lifestyle practices. And I think those are just as important getting into the infrared sauna and taking my exercise routine to a a lower level as well too, which I had to do. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I thought you were just going to say, I thought you were going to say, take it to the next level. And I was like, oh, no, no, you had to bring it down. I had had to to as well. Yeah. It was hard. It was very hard hard. to, yeah. I'm someone who's drawn to the spin class and the running and the hardcore. And I had to kind of slow that down a little bit so that I could heal. And it's hard when you're feeling overwhelmed with your symptoms and maybe feeling you know, sticky and bloated and all that yucky stuff, you want to work out more, but you you can't and you have to slow it down. And then when you start to feel better, gauge your energy appropriately. And now like this morning, I went for a 20 minute run, but every other block, one block I ran, one block I walked. So like, I'll just, you know, tweak it in my own way or going for long bike rides. Like you'll find other forms of exercise to fill that void, but that aren't as intense, no CrossFit, no high intensity spin classes, like really try and gauge it. Um, so that was a big part of it too. And it was, yeah. And you know, I think there's this underlying theme in all my conversations throughout this series, which is it takes time. You have to be super patient. It's not as easy as for some people just taking the drugs, here's your thyroid medication, which most people think that that is their answer is here, just take your thyroid medication and you'll be fine. 
it, it, unfortunately, you have to change your diet, which is going to take some time. You have to adjust your exercise and you have other, you know, what you call pillars of health. So let's just go through those that you feel were, you know, instrumental in your own healing that others should probably be following as well. Cause I, I'd have to agree. Totally. So some of them, again, might seem so basic, but it's about yeah. making better choices. So the first one being hydration, but it's not just about drinking lots of water, which we all should be doing. It's about the quality of your water too. Are you making sure that you're, depending on where you're living in the world, a lot of people have access to pretty poor tap water. So can you get basic or more upgraded filters at home to take out some of those contaminants? And we have something called the Big Berkey at home, which is a stainless steel nothing sexy, but it just sits on your countertop. And for the price that you're paying, which can be anywhere between 150 to $500, depending on the size, it's so worth it. You're getting such high quality water versus putting in a whole reverse osmosis system, which I find can be really depleting and might starve your body of nutrients that it needs, like certain minerals in the water. So water, quality water, water. and enough of it, and making sure you're not getting to that point where you're too thirsty sleep. So we haven't even talked about sleep yet in terms of my- So important. So important. So that's been also a big area that I've really dialed in on. I've always had pretty good sleep, but there's definitely been bouts of time where, you know, it's gone sideways. But again, focusing on like creating the space and moving into a new home where we had the chance to really kind of customize our bedroom and do things to have blackout blinds and have an organic mattress and good bedding and setting up the space for a good quality sleep is huge. So take inventory of what your bedroom looks like right now. Do you have a lot of lights buzzing? Do you have, you know, uh, like an alarm system on your ceiling that's got like a green light pointing down at you all night long all those things add up so how can you create that bedroom space to be as optimal for sleep as possible that's one layer to look at another one is the hours before sleep so after dinner before you go to sleep start to settle down you know dim your lights at home have a cup of tea take a bath journal meditate do all those things that can really bring you into that parasympathetic mode and really kind of slow your system down before you get into sleep and, and increase your melatonin levels as well too. So by having, uh, by putting that as a priority, like Jesse and I have really made sure we get into bed between 10 and 11, we try for earlier, but somewhere in that range for sure. Try and go to, sorry, we get in bed right before 10, try and go to sleep is somewhere between 10 and 11. That's key too. You do it is. not want to go to bed past 11 or if you do really consider how you're feeling the next day because to me oh my gosh, 11 know. sounds so late to me i'm like 9 9 p.m oh Good. quick get you into bed at nine? Do you fall asleep at nine or by 9 30 usually yeah oh yeah but i get up at six yeah. Good for you. That's awesome. I'd like to like, that's, I love goal. a good nine hours. Marnie. Nine hours is like golden to me. I think. And uh, you sleep straight like, through pretty much now, okay. now that I've had my thyroid fixed, I, I couldn't before, but now that that's kind of getting wow. better, I can now sleep pretty solid through the night. Yeah. That's amazing. I yeah. Know. So yeah, for me, it's yeah 1030. And typically I wake up anywhere between 530 and seven, depending on the day. Um, but I find, yeah, that window before 11 is key because you just feel drunk and hung over the next day when you go to bed past 11. Yeah. So sleep next pillar and then, uh, movement. So it's just talking about exercise and slowing things down and you don't even have to focus on exercise per se. It can just be movement and moving more throughout the day. So, you know, what, if you're at a desk job and you're sitting all the time, what can you do in your chair or get up and can you do some lunges or squats beside your chair or can you park for our, farther away from where you have to go to so you can walk a little bit more all those things again add up so getting more movement in um we've talked about nutrition we can get more into it but nutrition being a huge key component and a huge key pillar to rebuilding your health and feeling more in control and really focusing on greens high quality fats nutrient dense proteins and i can recommend things like the organ meats and uh, the shellfish and all that. I think that's great. I can't eat them yet. I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> I believe in them and I think they're amazing and they work wonders. And I know that that's kind of where the goal is to aim for. So right now I eat a lot of dark meat. So I'll eat like dark meat chicken. I'll do wild fish. I'll do some halibut. I'll do 
um, a little bit of red meat once in a while, or some wild buffalo, things like that. But I can't, can't, can't quite get into the organ meats yet. Um, I can't either. I've tried. I've tried smothering it in bacon fat, wrapped in bacon, <laughs> in yeah. little tiny bites in tomato sauce. I heard that would, would work. I've tried it in so many ways and I can't do it. So if you can do it, that's great. It's great. Go for it. Yeah. Please do. Exactly. So that's yeah, nutrient dense, good quality fats, fermented foods. Mm-hmm. And if you're not on the autoimmune protocol, which I don't know how detailed we need to get in that or if you want me to, but on the AIP protocol, you don't include nuts and seeds. So if you're not on that, include some good quality nuts and seeds and nut butters. Those are awesome and a really good sustaining source of protein and fat. Um, I will say on that, because I do work with autoimmune, um, yeah. it's one of the, the protocols that I'll use for people. Um, I have found that w- people with Hashimoto's tend to handle nuts and seeds better than other people with autoimmune conditions. Nuts and seeds don't have the chemical in it that the nightshades do that can cause the inflammation. Mm. So they're not necessarily a horrible thing. They've got lectins in them. So, you know, it's great to sprout there, or soak them and all that. But right. so I find that it, they are e- much easier to- tolerated in people with Hashimoto's than other autoimmune conditions, but it's always a good idea to remove them for a month because they are one of the highest food sensitivities um, and people with Hashimoto's tend to have gut problems. So right. um, if that's the case, then no, you're not going to do well. You're not going to do great with digesting them. But down the road, once you're, you know, your antibodies come down, but it's something that is really quite individual for each person, I find. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I find overall, I do pretty good with nuts. Sometimes Same. I'm eating like cashews and a couple hours later, I'm like, do I have a headache because of those or not? Or <laughs> yeah, I can't tell, yeah. but overall nuts are a big part of my diet. So were eggs and so were chocolate, which were the three things that were the hardest thing for me when I was on the AIP diet. Yes. Like yeah. Everything else, no problem. Nightshades, don't eat them. Like there's so many things that were so easy about AIP except for those. So yeah. Eggs, yeah. Chocolate, and nuts I, are a big part of my diet right now. <laughs> I think it's good to always, I always say to clients, try it for 30 days. Like if, if going paleo wasn't quite enough or you still have inflammation, you still have the ant, like high antibiotics, Bodies, for sure, give the autoimmune protocol a try mm-hmm. for a minimum of 30 days, preferably longer, but it takes about 30 days for those antibodies to leave the system. And then you can reintroduce one at a time and see which ones. I've had people, I had one woman, she, she puked from eating peppers after 30 days. Like, and she would have had no idea that she, that wow. was bothering her. But then, you know, potatoes were fine. Right. So to each, every person is going to have, react differently to those foods that are taken out from the autoimmune protocol. Totally. So, mm-hmm. totally. Yeah. So, okay. I'll pick back up. So which other foods? Collagen and bone broth, of course. Yes. Key yep. healing foods. Like that's been critical for me. And it's funny because when I first started eating meat, there was no way I was going to, first of all, there's no way I was going to eat dark meat. It was only chicken breast. At the beginning, because right. I was yeah. just easing my way, way into it, and now I won't even eat chicken breast. <laughs> and I definitely wasn't going to cook a whole chicken at first, and now I definitely cook a whole chicken and make my own bone broth. So it's an evolution. You just got to kind of test yourself, you know, one step at a time. And I really did take that slow and steady approach. I was buying bone broth from trusted sources. And then I bought, I think, a half a chicken or a thigh on a bone. I was like, okay, I can do this. And I worked my way up. So, so one bone at a time. Just one bone at a time. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And now it doesn't even phase me. I just like get right in there and it's, it's awesome. Um, so nutrition, like lots of goodies there. And I think there's just so, the world of grain-free eating has just become so fun for me to experiment with things like cassava and um, banana flour and mm-hmm. sweet potato flour and tiger nut, like all that stuff. It's, it's so versatile and you can make anything from muffins to baked goods, like other, you know, whether it's a cake or brownies, it's, it's so fun and you can really not miss your old school things that you really, might think you that you easily yeah. do it. Yeah. People don't realize when they first hear it, they're like, Oh my gosh, how could I possibly take all this out of my diet? And it's like, actually when you need it, like I just had a muffin that was almond flour, you know, it had some flax in it. It had stevia sweetened chocolate chips and some nut. It was delicious. And some banana. That was it. And it's yeah. like, it's like a treat to me. And it's, it's like a, bana- it's like a real muffin. It is a real muffin. <laughs> it is a real muffin exactly. without actual flour in it. Yeah. Delicious. There's, some, there's a substitute for everything. There is. There is. And I think a lot of people are 
thoroughly impressed when they start to experiment with this stuff at home and seeing what you can do Mm -hmm. without the grains. And even when you're making dishes at home, like the pastas and the rices that you can make with cauliflower and pizza crust, like it's, it's all available to you. You just have to get in there and try it out. Yeah, exactly. So is there other pillars? Did we, it was at six? I'm not sure. It was, uh, we got two more. So okay. self-care, which I lightly touched on, which is taking yep. time yourself in the morning or at night or during the day, whatever that means for you and doing things that you love. I think this is an area that a lot of women, especially neglect. They oh, don't yeah. take that time and they don't think that they deserve an hour during the day to go get a massage or go and meet up with a friend for coffee. That stuff matters. You need to pull yourself away from the rat race and, and do things for you. So self-care, build that into your routine. And last but not least is community. Yes. Connecting with different people, whether it's, you know, it shouldn't be only online, but online is a great place as long as it's intentional and productive connections yeah. and, you know, not just this loose, like, 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 like you want, you know, you want it to be intentful. Um, but get out in your community, like physically, like go out to different restaurants that maybe are conducive to your way of eating. If there's a paleo spot or go to a yoga class or go sign up for, I don't know, some event that might be coming up in the area. Like on Thursday night, I'm going to a paint and meditation workshop. I'm Great. going by myself. Yeah. Uh, I love painting. I love meditating. I'm going to do the two things together and I'm going to go get out in the community and go meet people and go have fun. Or maybe I, you know, I'll interact a little bit. Maybe it'll just be about me and doing my own thing, but find those things and also reevaluate the people who are in your life currently. Are your friendships working for you? Are, you know, family members that are, you're in touch with all the time. Is it working for you? Like, or is yeah. it dragging you down? Do you need a little bit of a break? So these are all things that, again, wear away at our, as a, at our system. They stress us out. They can affect how we eat. They can affect how we sleep. All the pillars are totally interrelated because they all affect one another. Yeah. So yeah. community is really important. It, all those things. And I think a lot of us um, that, like I said, that are suffering with thyroid or any health issue for that matter, we want the quick fix. We want the pill. We want, you know, just tell me what to eat. Give me the pill. That's it. And you're clearly, and myself included, there was so much stress involved in the triggering of the symptoms. There was, you know, all these nutrient deficiencies in myself, infections, possible gut infections. There's all these layers to the health problem. Mm-hmm. And it takes all of these pillars that you're talking about. I fully believe in all of those to really get your health back again. You can't just have one because it's likely that you're going to have to get all of it. You can't, you will never fully restore your health if you're not sleeping. If you're, if you're not eating well and you're still eating those processed foods and all the sugar and the grains and the beans and you have an autoimmune condition, guess what? You're not going to feel any, you're only going to get to a certain place. You may get better, but you're only going to get to to here when you could be to here, right? If you don't start taking care of your body, stress is going to go up. Cortisol goes up. Cortisol and thyroid are partners, man. They, they need to work synergistically together. It can't be too high. It can't be too low. All of these things, you know, have to be part of it. And it may sound overwhelming to some of some of my listeners right now, but it's, it's about slowly, like, like, like she's like Marnie's talking about, she took it, she took years to go through all of this and just slowly start putting these into place. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it doesn't happen overnight, but you can certainly start just becoming aware right now of your life and maybe the areas that you do need to focus on. I always like doing that pin the wheel where mm-hmm. you have each chunk of your six pillars, let's say, yep. and it's like, okay, which one, <laughs> you know, where is it? You know, am I having too much time over here where it's like exercise women will always justify exercise and so they'll have like you know a quarter of their wheel just exercise and it's like no you need to fit in these other you know four totally. or five wheels or spokes yeah exactly 100%. right <laughs> they have to find the balance so kind of yeah. looking at it from a okay if I, th- you know, by looking at it, I think, okay, a diet maybe needs to come first, then focus on your diet first, get that under control, then move on to, okay, I need to start taking more time for myself. I'm just going to schedule in a massage once in a while or take time to meditate or go for a right. walk, whatever it is. But you can slowly just start to implement these things and then it becomes a way of life, doesn't it? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. As I know mine, I can't live without those things now. 
right? Like if I find, if I'm getting too slow on the self-care, I feel it. And it's like, okay. Exactly. I need That's to go the see my acupuncturist. <laughs> yeah. We, and we know like when you... Mm-hmm. Maybe map those things out. And maybe that's part of your homework after this is to go yes. map those things out. And you know which one you're lacking in or which one you're, you know, not paying enough attention to. Are you going to bed at one o'clock in the morning? Are you, yeah, still eating something in your cupboard that you know you shouldn't be? So you know, and only you can kind of reassess and yeah, you know, and fix those ratios. Yeah, exactly. So as kind of like a partying thing, I just you know, there's so much information right now on diets and what to eat and what not to eat. And there's so much dogma around it and people get angry, especially vegans get, seem to get really, not to bash vegans, but you know, it's like a religion. Like they, they, they hold on. And now we've got keto people doing that too, where it's just like this keto is the end all be all. And I'm going to hold on to this and it's the best. And it doesn't screw up your thyroid. Like I've heard it all. And it is, it's like a religion to some people when it comes to their diet. So you coming from this background, your entire world, your business, your life had been this, you know, super clean, super healthy vegetarian diet. And you know, is there something that you had to let go, like mind in your head to help you transition and to begin accepting maybe that you needed to change and be kind of open-minded to changing? Mm -hmm. I think for me, when I started to, firstly, when I started to hear the story over and over again, so I started to relate to other people. It's like, okay, that sounds similar to me. They were this stuck on this way of thinking, being vegan or whatever, and they wrote a book maybe or had a blog. And they were able to make this transition that kind of allowed me to relate to them and think, okay, if they can do that, I can do that too. Um, so that was kind of step one. You let that sink in for a while. And then you, I found for me, like when I let that kind of marinate, the craving and the urge to want to eat animal protein came over time. Like I saw eggs being cooked. I was like, hmm, maybe I'll try one of those today. Like, you know, I remember distinctly being at Jesse's parents' house and they were making eggs for lunch. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have an egg. And so it was like, it's amazing and miraculous how that happens when you're so adamant and so no, no, no. And same with fish. I never, so I thought eggs was enough. I'm like, okay, that's good. I've brought eggs back in. I'm getting some good nourishment. If I eat flesh, like there's not a chance. And when I, you know, thought about eating fish, it made me sick to my stomach. But again, same thing. I was sitting in a restaurant. I'm like, I'm going to order fish tonight. Jess is like, you are? I'm like, yes, I am. I'm going to do it. I could imagine be like, oh my gosh, this is like this huge, big, like, ah. you know, it was such a big moment, but it's so funny how I ate it. And I actually felt my brain light up. Like wow. I felt a difference in my body. So a couple little experiences like that started to show me that animal protein started to become a supplement for me. I looked at it as like this nourishing supplement that my body was missing and that it needed to repair and restore and build my health back up. It wasn't so much of, oh, like I'm craving it. This feels so good to eat this again. Like I, I did eventually start to acquire the taste for it and want to prepare it more and more. I don't go by a day right now without having some form of animal, animal protein, but it's not out of like a craving. It's out of like, this is what my body needs to nourish and repair. So having that mindset shift in terms Mm. of how I looked at the food and, you know, let my body feel it out. It made such a difference. Yeah. You shifted into that, like from a, it went into almost the nutrition standpoint. It was like, you became open-minded and thought, okay, no, this is actually what my body needs right now. It's not that you're dying to eat it. It's that you knew from a nutrition standpoint, I need to try this and see how it feels. Right. Because my reasons for becoming vegetarian in the first place was both health focused and ethical. Always been an animal lover. I've seen all the documentaries. Like I was, you know, that was part of my tipping point into pushing me to become vegetarian. But so of course that creeps up and you're starting to eat meat again. You know, you're thinking of your dog, you're thinking of the horses, you're thinking, you know, (laughs) of the cows and whatever. And But when you kind of scale back, A, I've made a conscious decision to have good quality protein. I'm choosing, you know, happy animals. I'm paying extra money. I'm hopefully having smaller portions because I don't need to have as much and really consciously choosing what I'm eating. And 
it, it just, it didn't, it took time, but it didn't affect me as much over time. In the beginning, it did a little bit. As I said, I couldn't eat the red meat. So it just grossed me out and I couldn't see the bones. But again, as now, it's just, it's food, it's nourishment, it's for my body. And I'm really committed to that. So it's like, awesome. there's no going back at this point. <laughs> no. Yeah. And, and maybe you will. I always say you, maybe you will. never, no. you, what, it, what your diet is today might not be what it's going to be tomorrow. And you have to be open-minded to changing it when the time comes. There's totally. just, you know, for some people that are on keto, it's like, it doesn't have to be the end all be all to the day you die or whatever. There's going to be different forms of it. And I love on your, on your blog, um, where you actually say like, I'm paleo-ish. <laughs> Like, yeah. you know, that's what I would people are always like, well, how do you eat? And I'm like, I don't even think it has a word. Yeah, <laughs> Paleo, exactly. sometimes keto. I even have sometimes gluten-free products. So I don't yeah. know. What am I? <laughs> Whatever you want. Whatever feels yeah. right, right? Yeah. To each person is going to be something different. But I think the bottom line is when you've got Hashimoto's especially, an autoimmune condition. Mm -hmm. I think hands down, I know in my practice, you definitely want to remove those inflammatory foods as much as you can because you will feel a big difference. Yeah. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Yeah. So we can find you, I know on the ultimate health podcast, which is uh, one of the top rated health podcasts. It's amazing. And she's got amazing speakers on it. I just saw that you had Miguel Lu what is his uh, name? Yeah, Domingo Ruiz, the four agreements guy. Yeah. So how, how did she get him on there? <laughs> he's awesome. And Jesse and I have been just adamant on just finding and yeah. speaking to and highlighting some of the best of the best and having fun with them and just sharing their message. So there's a lot of great conversations and a lot of different conversations in the realm of health, which covers yes. so much. So. Yeah. I like how you guys, I, I do that too in my podcast where it's, there's health and nutrition stuff, but then you also, it's like the health of your spirit as well and, and kind of touching in on that. So I you know highly recommend checking her podcast out, especially if you like this podcast. And, um, and you can find Marnie at MarnieWaserman.com, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'll Instagram put all the, and yeah. All kinds of fun stuff and you have there. lots of beautiful pictures and she's a foodie. So you're going to yeah. get lots of fun little foodie things on there. And I just like checking out your pictures. They're beautiful. So yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.